if a patient presents to you with a fist over the left side of the chest, with an anxious look and sweating all over the face, the first and foremost thing which should come into your mind should be cardiac pathology. And mainly this is a angina, anginal pain. The causes could be ischemia or infarction. And in layman terms, the myocardial infarction is called as heart attack. So in this video, we will discuss what are the types of MI, what is the pathology or why it is caused, the etiology and the risk factors. Also, we'll discuss about the diagnosis, how do we diagnose MI and the main part is the treatment of MI. Also, we'll be discussing about the complication and the last is the differential diagnosis. So we'll talk everything about MI in this video. So keep watching this video till the end. Till that time, I'll introduce myself. I'm Dr. Chirag Madan, working as an intensivist ICU consultant at Apollo Hospital, New Delhi. So without wasting much time, let's begin. Now, talking about the clinical presentation. As we discussed, patients usually present with a fist over the left side of the chest, which is called as Levine sign, important for your MCQs. And this pain is usually intense, substernal, and usually remains for 20 to 30 minutes and maybe more. And this pain could radiate to the jaw and to the neck, also to the left side or left arm. Now the nature of the pain could be squeezing, aching or burning sensation. And some patients present with discomfort or pain in the epigastric area or sensation of fullness. The other symptom could be fatigue or malaise. And if we talk about the signs, there could be increased heart rate, which is tachycardia, increase in blood pressure, which is because of the sympathetic drive and there could be increased respiratory rate. And in cases, let's say, we'll talk about later, if uh, there is inferior wall MI or a right ventral infarction, then patient having a distended neck veins. So this is, uh, th these are the signs and symptoms which the patient presents with. Now, talking about the MI. As the name says, MI is myocardial infarction. Myo means muscle. Cardiac is obviously the, uh, the cardiac origin and infarction is death of the tissue or the necrosis, right? Now we'll uh, discuss, there are three different entities, ST elevation MI, non-ST elevation MI and unstable angina. And these three, all these three entities, they come under ACS, that is acute coronary syndrome, right? Now. As the name says, coronary. First of all, the heart, the function of the heart is just like a pump. It pumps blood to the entire body and receives blood, obviously, from the entire body, which is called as preload. Uh, now, heart itself gets the supply from the coronary arteries. If there is any pathology in the coronaries, that causes ACS. And there we have all the three, STEMI, NSTEMI and unstable angina. Now, how do you differentiate these three? First of all, and now we are coming on to the pathology. So mainly these MI or these anginal pains are attributed by the uh, atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries. Now this atherosclerosis along with a cap, there is a fibrinous cap. This is called as plaque. Now, if th this is present in the coronary artery, there is for sure impairment of the blood flow to the distal part, which causes ischemia. And this ischemia is responsible for the anginal pain. So if a patient has just the ischemia, there is no death of the tissue, no death of the myocardial or the heart tissue, then, there is, then it is just called as unstable angina. So, in unstable angina, there is pain and if we talk about cardiac markers, they are negative. I'll talk about in the later part of the video. Now, let's say this plaque is somewhat uh, partially occluding the coronary artery, right? Somewhat occluding. So, there is 
further impairment of the blood flow to the distal part which obviously causes ischemia and there is some infarction also infarction is death of the tissue now the death of the tissue causes or the necrosis of the tissue causes release of troponins in the blood which are called as cardiac biomarkers or cardiac enzymes right uh, and this is a contractile pr protein by the way the troponins so uh, these are released whenever there is infarction of the heart tissue or the myocardium so the in in this second entity there is sub endocardial infarction or necrosis right sub endocardial this is no not full length just the sub endocardial and in usually in these kind of situation there occurs um, depression of the st segment or inversion of the t waves so this entity is called as nstemi that is non st elevation mi whereas if we talk about the third one and the third entity is stemi where there is full occlusion of the coronary arteries now uh, there is a plaque if plaque ruptures or fissures right so that causes accumulation of the platelet at the site and that causes full occlusion of the coronary arteries now when it is fully occluded obviously the, the there is no flow of the blood to the distal part and then the whole muscle is infarcted or dead now this total is called as transmural involving all the layers so transmural infarction is there in stemi and all because whole of the tissue is now gone or infarcted there is intense release of cardiac biomarker mainly troponins so now again revising all the three in unstable angina there is just the pain there is, there they can be ecg changes but cardiac markers are negative there are no troponins in the blood talking about the nstemi the there is for sure anginal pain if we see the ecg there is either uh, no st elevation mi or you can say there can be st depression with or without t wave inversion and having a cardiac biomarkers in the blood that means troponins are present right troponin in, on a higher side Th talking about the third one that is the stemi in this obviously there is anginal pain then in the ecg there is st elevation and thirdly there is for sure increase in troponins in the blood level so these are the three different entities along with the pathology which we discussed now we have discussed why it happened the cause mainly the atherosclerosis the plaque formation and the rupturing now in which individual this is on a higher side or what are the risk factors so they are firstly non modifiable risk factor which are age the sex of the patient the genetics of the patient right these are non modifiable and if we talk about modifiable risk factors the first and foremost i'll talk about is smoking that irritates and causes plaque fissuring or rupture of the plaque second it could be the increased blood pressure third it could be increased in cholesterol or the lipid content fourth obesity fifth stress to the patient so these are the causes which increases the risk of having a mi or the anginal pain also myocardial infarction has five types type 1 spontaneous mi in which there is plaque rupturing plaque fissuring erosion of the plaque right second is due to imbalance between the oxygen demand and supply which happens in uh, coronary embolus coronary artery spasm and type 3 is mi uh, resulting in cardiac arrest when biomarkers are unavailable or you are not able to send the biomarkers even right now type 4 is divided into two 4a and 4b 4a is related to pci percutaneous intervention 4b is related to stent thrombosis and type 5 is related to cabg so these are the five types of mi which you should be knowing now talking about the diagnosis so whenever you are having this kind of presentation so you are thinking in terms of cardiac pathology 
The blood samples you need to send is first of all you have to check the blood sugar when the patient is having this kind of discomfort, anxious and sweating. Blood sugar is to be done first and foremost. Second is complete blood count. Third is cardiac biomarkers, mainly the troponin I. And nowadays which what we are using is high sensitive troponin I. Right? It is the earliest marker to be detected in the serum. And you have to see the serial, uh, serial values at zero hour, zero, I mean, at the presentation, then three hours, then six hours. Then fourth is the lipid profile of the patient. And then obviously you send the other blood investigation like kidney function test and liver function test also. Apart from that, to make a diagnosis, you need a 12 lead ECG also. Very, very, very important. And uh, I'm uh, so much excited and happy to say that we have recently released our ebook on ECG. And I'm extremely happy with the response which the ebook has got. I mean, I didn't expect this kind of response. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much for the love and support you have shown to our ebook. In that, we have discussed uh, 10 basic steps how to read or interpret an ECG in a simple and an interesting manner. And also there are questionnaires at the back of the ebook and along with that you will get a, a free live lecture with the ECG ebook right and you can find the link in the description box below so now coming back to the topic as you can see over here uh, these are the limb leads and 2-3 AVF are in the lower part or the inferior part so if 2-3 AVF has ST elevation or J point elevation then this is called as inferior wall MI because inferior wall is involved. Now, if there is ST elevation or J point elevation in one or AVL, that goes in favor of lateral wall. So one AVL also V5, V6, that goes in lateral wall MI. If V1 and V2 are involved, then septal. If V2 to V4 is involved, then anterior wall. And if from let's say V1 to V4, it is called as antroseptal. Also, using these areas, you get to know which coronary artery is mainly involved. If it is inferior wall MI, so mainly it is RCA, right coronary artery, right? Uh, so I'll not go much in detail uh, in this video. So this is just about the diagnosis. How do we diagnose it? Now, apart from ECG, you can go for cardiac imaging, mainly ECO echocardiography now this tells you regional wall motion abnormality which we normally call as rwma so this was about the diagnosis now the main part is the treatment so whenever you have these kind of patient in pre-hospital setup i mean the patient is just in the ambulance or at home the important thing is to give a loading dose of antiplatelet mainly the aspirin which is normally a loading dose of 300 milligram. But uh, outside, this is in India. Outside India, they, they prefer to have uh, in multiples of 81. So 81, 162, 325, right? So, uh, so, so you can find that in books also. In India, we give a loading dose of 300 milligram of aspirin, right? And there is a mnemonic uh, called as MOAN, M-O-A-N. So A stands for aspirin. Now, the other thing is O is oxygen supplementation. It is to be given whenever the saturation is less than 90% or PaO2 is less than 60 milliliters of mercury. Otherwise, there is no use. In fact, in, uh, it has been uh, somewhat found to be detrimental, right? So always supplement the oxygen whenever the patient is hypoxemic. Saturation less than 90 or PaO2 less than 60, right? Then third is N is nitrates. So this nitrate is very, very helpful to the patient. So you can give as a sublingual tablet, 0.4 milligram, whenever in a pre-hospital setup. And this normally causes decrease in vascular resistance, SVR, and causes decrease in preload also, right? And this also dilates, vasodilates the coronary artery, causing relief of the pain. Right? So nitrates are to be given to the patient. And whenever the patient is in hospital setup, try to give IV NTG at a dose of 5 to 10 micrograms per minute. Right? Uh, and, but whenever the 
before giving nitrate, you need to check the blood pressure of the patient. If the patient is bradycardic or hypo hypotensive, do not give nitrates. Secondly, uh, to uh, get a relief from the pain, you can give IV morphine also, 2 to 4 mg. So this is just uh, whenever you see the patient in the emergency or in the pre-hospital. But the best or the definitive treatment is the reperfusion, which is called as PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention. In this, you do first of all angiography using a dye. You see which artery is occluded or not. And if at all the artery is found to be occluded, then you can open it using a stenting. So this is called as angioplasty, angiography and angioplasty, right? So this is the definitive treatment and it has to be done with the door to needle time of 90 minutes. So the door is the hospital door, right? So door to needle should be 90 minutes as early as possible and to be done uh, whenever the symptoms is less than 12 hours. Whenever you are planning to have a PCI done, before that you need to load with another anti uh, platelet also which is P2Y12 receptor antagonist. There are three of it. First, clopidogrel, second, ticagrelor and third, prasugrel. The loading dose of uh, clopid is 300 to 600 milligram. So normally we give 300 milligram of clopidogrel. Secondly is uh, ticagrelor, the loading dose of 180 milligram and prasugrel, the loading dose of 60 milligram. Right? And if at all, let's say patient is not undergoing PCI, then also you have to give clopidogrel or any of these three along with aspirin also. Right? Now, let's say uh, there is no facility of PCI in a hospital or, or the, the clinician is not able to perform, this, uh, they are not capable to do the PCI. Uh, then the other alternative is fibrinolysis. Previously, there was uh, uh, streptokinase was used, but now it is not used because of the complication rates. Now, uh, the agents which are used are tenecteplase, altiplase, and retiplase. The tenecteplase is normally used with a dose of 30 mg in less than 50 kg and 50 mg in more than 90 kg. So, the dose is 30 to 50 mg, right? Now, uh, after initial management, you have to do a maintenance therapy, which is by lifestyle modification, adding beta blocker or ARVs, and third is continuation of dual antiplatelet for at, in a maintenance dose for at least one year, right? So this is the maintenance. Now, complications of MI. So you can remember the complication by a mnemonic, MAD PALS, where M stands for mechanical rupture which could be left ventricular free wall rupture, interventricular rupture, or papillary muscle wall rupture, right? A stands for arrhythmias. D stands for Dressler syndrome, which is post-myocardial infarction syndrome, and normally it is an autoimmune phenomena, and which, is, which usually develops after two to three weeks of MI, and presents as a pericarditis or pleural effusion, uh, pericardial effusion. Then P stands for pericarditis, a stands for uh, aneurysm of left ventricle. L stands for LVF or you can say as pulmonary edema. And S stands for shock, which is mainly cardiogenic shock. So this is just a mnemonic so as to memorize it. Now talking about the differential diagnosis, because whenever you have this kind of pre presentation, don't get biased to cardiac pathology only. You need to have a differential also. So it could be GRD or acute gastritis or there could be uh, aortic dissection, acute cholecystitis, then there could be mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation, simple anxiety disorder, right? Or there could be pericarditis, myocarditis or even pulmonary embolism, right? Pneumothorax and uh, uh, pneumonia or even. So you need to rule out everything. So this was all about uh, MI or uh, if you talk about the ischemic heart disease. I hope you like the content of this video. If yes, please hit the like button and share with your friends and colleagues. And do not forget to subscribe this channel to get the latest updates of our new videos. Thank you so much guys. Bye bye.
Take care.